the way things are going today, I think we may be seeing him much sooner than what we think. Amen? Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We are beginning a series entitled Spiritual Insights into secular issues. We are, as believers, here in America, for the first time, really beginning to contemplate and face the stark reality that we, like others around the world, are about to face trials, tribulations, and persecutions on a par that we have never had to face. We have heard and continue to hear that we now live in a post-Christian America. And I agree with that. The faith of our fathers is greatly frowned upon. We have those in leadership who are trying to run from the spiritual roots that made this nation what it is. And we cannot have that without dire consequences. But we have to go to the core of what is the cause for the decline and what the Bible refers to, the apostasy that we are seeing evident before our eyes on a daily basis. What is the core? Well, the core is what the Bible identifies the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist has two sides. Lies. Lawlessness. Lies. Lawlessness. That is how the Bible describes for us what the spirit of Antichrist is, and what the spirit of Antichrist does. Now look with me, if you will. 1 John chapter 2, I call your attention to verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, Even now, even now, there are many Antichrist, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now look at verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Now look, if you will, chapter 4. Chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many False prophets are going out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come of the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come of the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and Even now, already, it is in 
the world. Now look at chapter 5, verse 19. Chapter 5, verse 19. And we know that we are of God. And the whole world lies in wickedness. The picture here in the Greek New Testament is that the whole world lies upon the lap of the wicked one. He is the God of this world. The prince, the power of the air. You and I need to be able to discern that which is true versus that which is false. That which is of God versus that which is of Satan. Now, back in chapter 2, John is speaking of the last days. Matter of fact, in verse 18, he uses the phrase, the last time, twice in that single verse. Now, if you want to understand what he's talking about, go back to verse 17. The world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. The world passes away. Literally, the world is in a state of passing away. The world is not going to get better and better. The world is going to become more corrupt. And so, John, speaking of the last days, speaks of a time of crisis. A last hour kind of time. The idea is that the clock is running down. The midnight hour is soon to be upon this world. Paul talked about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, when he states, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The mystery of lawlessness. It's already in play. Now think with me for a moment. You're hearing men who wrote back in the first century. And they saw very clearly the impact of the spirit of Antichrist in their day. Imagine what they would write if they were writing in the 21st century. The spirit of Antichrist was working in Paul and John's day And the Bible tells us it is this very same spirit that is at work in our day. Now when we think about the spirit of Antichrist, it has a point of attack. Now Satan, his goal is to one day enthrone his man the Antichrist. Thus being able to rule the world under the auspices of this man. This will be Satan's man. As Jesus was the son of God the Father, the Antichrist will be the son of Satan. The son of perdition. The beast. He will not tolerate any rivals. He will seek to stamp out and destroy anyone or anything that would stand in his way. Now Satan knows the Bible to a certain extent. And I have to qualify that because I don't know really if he can truly put what is in the scriptures, put it together and uh, maybe change course. I don't know. But remember when Satan had Jesus out there in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, 
the temptations. Uh, don't you find it quite a, a, amazing that um, Satan is quoting Jesus' scripture? Uh, uh, of course, he's not quoting it correctly. But, but he's quoting the scriptures. And, and, and that's one of the things that you need to be aware of. There are a lot of people quoting the Bible, but they're quoting the parts that they want and leaving out the other parts. Making the Bible say what they want it to say. But one thing I do believe that the devil clearly understands. And this takes us all the way back to the beginning, Genesis 3.15. God made it completely clear that there would be the seed of the serpent, but there would be the seed of the woman, the virgin-born Son of God, Jesus Christ. And he makes it clear in Genesis 3.15 that in the end, in the end, the seed of the woman would destroy completely the seed of the serpent. Now we saw that at Calvary. The death sentence was completely issued at that moment. But in all honesty, the devil hasn't been executed. He will because that is the record of Scripture. But whether he knows that or not, he's working, trying to go contrary to what God has already established. And this is why he is working overtime to bring the world together for the purpose of placing his man over it thus creating for himself what he has always wanted. He wants to be king. But the Bible tells us that the Lord will let him climb the mountain. And at an appropriate time, a time of God's choosing, not only will God knock him off that mountain, but God will remove the mountain itself. So Satan, based upon whatever measure of knowledge he has of the word, if he has any understanding, he understands that there's only one person that can stop him. And that is Jesus Christ. So his attack focuses upon Jesus. And one of the things that he does is he comes and he lies about Jesus to the people, thus deceiving the people. And instead of following Jesus... He is able, through deception, to get people to follow him. You see, we have world elites that believe that they are actually building a better world. They honestly believe that. They believe that what they're doing is the right thing to do. It's the only way to save humanity in their book, in their thinking. But the problem is, there's a group of people like us who believe in Jesus Christ and know the book. And we know that what they're building is not of God. What they're building is of the devil. And it's not going to lead to the betterment of man. It's going to lead to the destruction of man. But see, because we know this, and we would voice this, we become a counter-agent 
to the program that is now in play. And so, on the one hand, as Satan is trying to put this world together so he can eventually rule it through his man, the Antichrist, on the one hand, as he does that, on the other hand, what does he have to do? He has to deceive as much of the population as he possibly can. And that work of deception, that work of lies, it always focuses first and foremost upon Jesus Christ. There is today, as there has been for many, many centuries, a truth crisis. A truth crisis. Uh, hold your place here and turn, if you will, back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The spirit of Antichrist not only is a spirit that attacks believers, that attacks the Word of God, it is a spirit that primarily attacks Jesus. So if the devil can convince me that Jesus is not who he claims to be, he has convinced me that Jesus did not do what Jesus said he did. Therefore, I have no reason to want to follow Jesus at all. So I've got to ask myself the question, okay, who has a better deal? Who has a better promise? And if I reject Jesus, my only other option is to follow the spirit of the age. Could you ever have imagined that the vast majority of our young people today are willing to embrace socialism and Marxism? I mean, it almost floors you. But again, it's the spirit of Antichrist, that spirit of deception. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled, deceived Eve through his subtility, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now how is he going to deceive? How is he going to corrupt? Now remember, the spirit of Antichrist attacks first and foremost the person and work of Jesus Christ. How is he going to do that? Look at verse 4. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Wow. Note if you will. To the pages of Scripture, we see the real Jesus. We see the real Spirit. We come to understand the real Gospel. But through the Spirit of Antichrist, note what he does. He presents another Jesus. The word another here is, in the Greek New Testament, not another of the same kind, but another of a different kind. In other words, the Jesus that the spirit of Antichrist gives birth to, that Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. That spirit is not the spirit of the Bible. That gospel is not the gospel of the Bible. You need to understand that we live in a time when there are multiple Jesuses, multiple spirits, and multiple gospels. In other words, the devil will come to you and say, what kind of Jesus do you want? I'll give it to you. What kind of spirit do you want to follow? I'll give that to you. What kind of gospel do you want to believe in? I'll give that to you. Whatever you want, I'll accommodate you. All the while not doing that for your betterment, but all the while doing it for your damnation. Now let me show you something really strange. In that same chapter, beginning verse 13. Verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. 
And no wonder, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Wow. You see, Satan really is in the Jesus business, in the spirit business, and in the gospel business. Matter of fact, he's got his own preachers. But they're liars. They're deceivers. They're destroyers. But then again, that is the spirit of Antichrist. Looking back at 1 John chapter 2. What is he doing? Look at verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that, des that denies the Father and the Son. A and then we see in chapter 4 verse 3. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Uh, no, when it comes to Satan attacking the person and work of Jesus, it's basically threefold. He attacks the fact that Jesus is the Christ. He attacks the fact that the Father and the Son are one, and he attacks the fact that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. In other words, he denies the oneness of Jesus' nature. Jesus is not a good man. If that's all he is to you, you're lost. You do not know the Jesus of the Bible. You say, that's narrow, preacher. No, it's not. That's Bible. And see, that's what people don't want today. They want a Burger King theology. I want to have it my way. May I remind you, the first person who went to the counter declaring, let me have it my way, none other than Satan. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will by, be like the Most High. And so he leads people to deny the oneness of Jesus' nature. He leads people to deny the deity of Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God, but He's also God the Son. And they lead people to deny the humanity of Jesus. He is the Son of Man. You see, as a man, Jesus would die. But as God, Jesus would conquer sin, death, and the grave, thus be, being the Savior of the world. You see, if, if, if Jesus is not who he claims to be, then it stands to reason Jesus could not do what he claimed to have done. A good man cannot save you, but a God man can. The spirit of Antichrist sets out to destroy these two foundational truths of the Word of God, and that is... Number one, the incarnation. You know, from time to time I, I read some of the religious periodicals. And I hear these intellectual, religious academics spending all this time trying to explain away why you shouldn't believe in the incarnation. You see, if there is no incarnation, then the second thing that goes out of the window is the resurrection. But the resurrection proves the incarnation. Jesus was born of a virgin by the Spirit of God. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And though he died in a human body on Calvary, and though they put that human body in a tomb, and sealed it with a Roman seal and set a Roman guard. On that third day, he came out God. For only God could conquer sin, death, and the grave. If you believe in a Jesus of a lesser 
measure than what I have just described for you, you're lost. Because you don't know the Jesus of the Bible. And so what is Satan doing? He is blinding by use of lies. And it seems like the people would have it so. Turn, if you would, back to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to show you something. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Talk about the ultimate liar. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we are introduced to Satan's superman. Look, if you will, in verse 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. This is Satan Superman, the Antichrist, the beast. Now, when he shows up, here's what he's going to do. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sets in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Satan's desire has always been to be God. But he's not. Now look, if you will, verse 7. In order for him to do this that we've just read, he has a program in place. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That's his program. Lies and lawlessness. But even though we're able to see what we are able to see to this point, he cannot work in his fullness. Why? Look at verse 7. Only he who now allows will allow until he be taken out of the way. The he is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit today is in the world in two ways. Please understand this. The Holy Spirit today is in the world in two ways. Number one, because he is God, he is everywhere. He is everywhere. Omnipresent. Because the Spirit is God, He is omnipresent. But there's a unique feature in how the Spirit of God is in the world. Not only is the Spirit of God in the world by His presence, the Spirit of God is in the world by His presence in the church. We call it the residence. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, where does the Holy Spirit come to? He comes into you. We don't go to a temple. Why? Because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So, the Holy Spirit is, is in the world in His presence because He's God but in his residence because of the church. Now there's something that's holding back Satan from being able to really put his foot on the accelerator. And you know what it, what it is? It's us. It's us. No telling how bad we're going to see things become. But they can't reach the measure that the Bible tells us it will reach while we're here, God's got to take us out. And He will in the rapture. And then when the church is removed from the earth, that means that the Holy Spirit, though He will be present in the world, He will no longer be resident in the church. And with the church being removed, that restraining body is not there standing in the way of the wicked one and now the doors are wide open for the devil and his followers to do what we 
already see they want to do. Folks, I, I, I have to ask myself, how soon before I hear the trumpet? How soon before I hear those words, come up hither? How soon will it be before the Lord steps upon the clouds of the air and calls us home? But when that happens, the door, the green light is given to the devil. He can run with it. And so I ask you, if you can see what you see now, imagine how bad it will be when we're gone. Well, I don't want to be left behind. And I won't. Why? Because I know Jesus as my personal Savior. I, I, I know the, the real Jesus. I have the real Spirit. Why? Because I know what the real gospel is. The gospel is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I know what the true gospel is. And I've staked my eternal claim to it. And yes, and yes, there are going to be people that we know that will be left behind. Now what happens to those who are left behind? Look at this, if you will. I'm about finished. Look at verse 8. Now remember, this, this program of lies and lawlessness, this is what is presently in play but it is being held in check because the church is still here on planet Earth. But once the church is taken out of the way, note verse 8, and then, and then, not while the church is here, but after the church is gone, and then shall that wicked one be revealed. You see, we're watching in our day the stage being set for his appearance. But he cannot appear while we're here. But once we're gone, he can step onto center stage and begin doing his thing. Look, if you will, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in in unrighteousness. There are those who are not saved, not because they've not heard the truth. I think about how many people have gone to church and they've heard the truth, but they just will not receive the truth. They reject it. It's not that they don't know. It's just they won't believe. They, they just won't believe. And because they won't believe the truth, here's what happens. They give themselves to what we call the five isms. Secularism. No God. Relativism. No truth. You know, this may be true for you, but it might not be true for me. Truth has become subjective. You can create your own truth. Not only can you create your own truth, you can create your own God. And then selfism. I alone matter. Me and my four no more. Get all you can and can all you get. It's all about me. And then materialism. The thirst for 
more. And then mysticism, the re-imaging of reality. If you don't like history, rewrite it. I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I was taken back. One of the first things that the new president did by executive order is he did away with the 1776 commission. Do you realize what that was all about? That commission was put into play so that they would be able to give a scholarly historical history of the founding of this country. Why did they do that? Because we had this new thing called the 1619 Project, which is absolutely bizarre. But now this new administration takes 1776 says, no, 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 that's not what we're going to teach in school. That's not what we're going to teach our young people. We're going to teach them this re-imaging of reality. That's just one example. Mysticism. Now, when people follow stuff like this instead of following what is clearly presented in the scriptures. Here's the end result. Humanism. Faith in man. Humanism has become basically our national religion. And I will show you when we talk about humanism that even the Supreme Court of the United States declared humanism a religion. So humanism, faith in man has now become our national religion. Materialism, love of stuff. Man, if that isn't an American invention, I don't know what is. Materialism, love of stuff, has become our God. We, do we not measure our lives based upon our stuff? Oh, you're successful, why? And then we start counting down the stuff that we have. Don't laugh. I see that in Southern Baptist Convention all the time. He who has the most stuff gets the recognition. And then hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure. That has now become our lifestyle. So humanism, our religion. Materialism, our God. And hedonism, our lifestyle. There are people that are not in church today. Not because they couldn't be here. Not even because of the coronavirus. But because they're out there doing some pleasurable activity. The spirit of Antichrist doth already work. And it's not going away. And so you and me as Christians, we better wake up and understand what kind of world it is that we're seeking to live and do ministry. It's not going to get easier. It's going to become demanding and it's going to be difficult. And we're going to find out in the process of time those who are and those who are not. You're going to find out whether or not you have a relationship with Jesus or you just have what we call the Baptist religion. And the Baptist religion is not going to get you to where you would like to go. Stand with me if you will. Heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment. I would love to be preaching on sweeter subjects than what I have been having to deal with. But as a shepherd, it is my job not only to feed you, but to protect you. And I can't protect you if I don't tell you the truth. I just simply this morning guided you through scripture. I named the scriptures 
you had the opportunity to turn in your Bible to read it for yourself. You do not have to take anything that I have said. You can read it yourself and see what God has to say. I'm just pointing it out. But apathy and ignorance is going to hurt us far more than what we realize. We've got to care. And the more we know, the more we will care. Amen? We'll care enough. Listen to me. We'll care enough to share the truth with family members, with friends, and yes, even work associates. Who do you know that needs to know Jesus? That's what I'm talking about. That's where it all comes down to. I can't change this world. You can't change this world. But I can share Jesus and Jesus can change a person. Amen? Amen. And that's what it's all about. Jesus changes people. And He does it how? One person at a time. One person at a time. Thank you for being here this morning.